Here we go. I don't know and no. So I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's been... <laughs> Can, can I ask you a follow-up on Angola? Yeah, no. one, one question. It is so surprising um, that you don't so, take, if you are receiving sorry. an African leader, I you have... can't take a question from an African okay, journalist. We can, we can I can't. Sorry, I, I have one question. Really okay. Basically, um, John, since I'm not going to It's not about ending the briefing. I want to ask an African question. Sorry. Because yeah, you are I'm receiving sorry. an African leader. Can I just ask a question? Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. All right. We can end this briefing if it's not going to be respectful here. Chris. That's what I'm saying. You are okay. receiving an African okay. leader and you don't take questions. Thanks, we everybody. Have a question about gas prices. Oh, thanks, everybody. Can we do one about right. the quality gas you. prices? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you people? What impact has the shooting uh, <coughs> of the Hamas taking credit for in Jerusalem? had on the efforts to extend the humanitarian pauses as the U.S. goal to turn these these pauses into a more permanent ceasefire? Is that the overall trend line that the U.S. is going for? I don't know and no. So I don't know. Uh, I don't think there's been... <laughs> um, I don't think there's been any uh, effect, not, not that I, not that I've heard or seen effect on the on the deal, extending the deal by the violence in Jerusalem. I've seen nothing that indicates an effect on that. Okay, okay. Go. And as, again, we do not support a permanent ceasefire at this time. We do support the idea of humanitarian pauses, and we would love to see, as I said at the outset, uh, we want to see this seven-day pause turn into eight, nine, ten, and beyond. Uh, but ultimately, that's going to take uh, Israel and, and Hamas to agree to the parameters of extending that deal. But in the United States, they'll continue to find an advocate for extension. And, and how is the alleged plot by an Indian government official to assassinate somebody on U.S. soil, how has that affected uh, U.S.-Indian relations, uh, you know, given that you know, the president recently hosted Modi for a state dinner, you know, relations have been trying to you know, improve, you know, tighten those relations. What impact does that plot have? I remind you the state dinner happened before we knew about sure, yeah, this. Exactly. And, I, and I want to be careful here that I don't get uh, ahead of the Department of Justice and talk about an ongoing investigation. I would just say two things. Is, uh, India remains a strategic partner, um, and we're going to continue to work to improve and uh, strengthen uh, that strategic partnership with India. At the same time, we take this very seriously, uh, uh, these allegations in this investigation, take it very seriously. And we're glad to see that the Indians are too, by announcing their own efforts to investigate this. And we've been clear that we want to see anybody held, uh, anybody uh, that's responsible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for these alleged crimes to be held properly accountable. Thank you. Um, on Venezuela, I wanted to ask about today is the deadline that the administration set uh, for the Venezuelan government to make progress on certain uh, things. One of them re uh, lifting the public bans of uh, political opposition leaders who cannot run in elections, start the process to release wrongfully detained Americans. So uh, my question is, have you seen any progress? And is the U.S. Uh, prepared to reimpose sanctions, uh, which was the consequence of, of not seeing progress on this? I haven't seen any progress uh, yet. There's eight hours left in the day, so we'll see what the Venezuelans decide to do. And I won't get ahead of decisions about sanctions one way or the other going forward. What the hell is the world coming to? <laughs> Thank you. I have a few questions about Angola. As you know, this exciting libido corridor runs through a part of uh, the DRC that's been embroiled in secessionist, violent conflict since 1960. Can the libido corridor work without peace in that region? And then to that point, how is the White House supporting President Lorenzo and his work as AU peace envoy to bring about peace? And then also, how is the administration engaging Bilaterally. You know, I'm on a time clock here. Um, this is the last, second to last one. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm going to start to write these down. Engaging bilaterally and multilaterally with Great Lakes leaders to bring about peace. And then finally, what's the President's message to President Lorenzo about his country's poor human rights track record? Uh, so, 
look, I'm going to try to boil this down. Otherwise, I'm going to be in big trouble. So, <laughs> um, the, president, the president's time. Over. Exactly. Yeah, me too. Um, th th uh, this is a relationship that has been improving now, as I said, over the last year. Um, and the president's very much looking forward to this meeting um, uh, with the Angolan president. Um, there's a lot of ground to cover. So we never shy away from talking about human rights. The president routinely brings that up. I won't get ahead of the president, and we'll have a readout. But, um, but we, he never shies away from talking about human rights when he's talking to foreign leaders. Oh! <laughs> uh, number two, um, uh, we welcome uh, President Lorenko's efforts to uh, uh, to foster peace. I, t I said that at my at the opening statement. Uh, his efforts on the continent to improve peace and security and stability are welcome, and I'm absolutely certain that the two leaders will talk about that today and the prospects for that and where that's going, including in the DRC. And number three, on the libido corridor, the president is very excited about this. This is a, a, a real landmark effort as part of PGI um, and, uh, and helping um, lower and middle income countries find sustainable investments in their infrastructure that can not only create jobs, but also open up economic opportunities, in this case, all across that southern part of, of sub-Saharan Africa. So it's very exciting and uh, we're going we're gonna to keep pushing forward with it. <laughs> so, thank you very much, Corrine, and thank you, John. Two very brief questions related to foreign policy. One, has the President had discussions with Speaker Johnson akin to those he had with Speaker McCarthy about the supplemental on Ukraine standing alone? And is the price tag on it sixty billion or forty-seven billion at this point? I don't. I don't. I have to get back to you on whether there was a specific conversation with the speaker on the supplemental. That said, we have had numerous discussions and briefings with members of Congress um, and staff members about the importance of the supplemental and moving on all four of those buckets: <laughs> Israel, Ukraine. Uh, the Indo-Pacific and, and border security. We want to see them act as quickly as possible on that. And the, and the total numbers are on the web to see, but... What's your